Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bren Carlyle, and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation of Australia. It is my pleasure to be speaking with Panina Shavit Baruch and Philip Deladakis this evening. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Knowing that this conversation is being watched in every Australian state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which people are watching this. Now tonight, uh, I have stuffed up because I stuffed up time difference because of daylight savings. Uh, because of that, Panina is only able to join us for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. We're gonna go straight to her and then Philip and I are going to discuss how to craft her education uh, and how how to talk about international law to our colleagues. Panina is going to talk about international law. She is, of course, the former head of the IDF International Legal Division, is now a senior researcher at the Institute for National Security Studies, which is based in Tel Aviv University. So let's go straight to it. Uh, Panina, I'm going to ask you tough questions, uh, um, questions that we find difficult to answer when our colleagues ask us, and I'm hoping that you can answer them. So. Question number one, if Israel isn't targeting civilians, why are so many people dying in Gaza? Okay, so um, hi everyone, and I will be very brief because we don't have much time, and then you can I can elaborate afterwards. You can ask me later, write questions. I also, I've written about some of the things I'm going to talk about, so you can find them in the INSS their website. Um, so we have to understand Hamas, we all know it's not respecting the laws of armed conflict. They're far from it. Uh, it's carrying out, it carried out the most heinous war crimes, crimes against humanity, even genocide. And since then, it's been continuing to target civilians and to use its civilians as shield. So, but that doesn't matter because Israel is still, there's no reciprocity. Israel is still uh, bound by the laws of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. It's the same thing. You know, if they say IHL or laws of armed conflict, it's, it's they are synonyms. So it still ab needs to abide by these rules. Now, the, 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 there are some basic principles when we're talking about targeting, uh, which is what we are discussing here. And the first one is the principle of distinction. And it means that you are allowed under the laws of armed conflict only to target military objectives uh, and combatants of the other side, and you are not allowed to target civilians and civilian objects, which is fine. But what we need to understand is that the definition of military objective, and I will read here, in international law, this is customary international law, it's, it's in the additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions, um, is that a military objective uh, is those objects which by their nature, location, purpose, or use make an effective contribution to military action and whose total or partial destruction, capture, or neutralization in the circumstances ruling at the time offers a definite military advantage. In other words, when a civilian object, whether it is a house, a school, a mosque, or even a hospital, and I'll come back to the hospitals, is used by the other side for its military purposes, it loses its civilian nature and it becomes a lawful military objective. This is the law. It's not a controversial law. This is, this is the accepted the, uh, law. Now, hospitals do have a specific uh, protection, which is stronger than the others, but what it means, what in essence, it means that if a hospital is used by the enemy, you can't immediately attack it. You have to first warn the enemy and say, stop using the hospital for your military purposes. And But if it continues, then it also becomes a lawful military objective. I will come in a moment. But to can the I just jump in there and, and ask you and ask you a follow-up question? Because yeah. we hear from, from the Red Cross and the WHO and everyone else and politicians in Australia that hospitals are always protected. Now, Article 19, the fourth Geneva Convention, clearly says if it's used for military purposes, it loses that protected status. Yes. But why would people say they're always protected and, you know, stake their reputation on that if they're not always protected? There is a, um, some groups, uh, mainly human rights organizations and the UN and parts of it, and sometimes also in academia that are that have this idea that by uh, 
uh, making the law very restrictive, they will somehow uh, save lives, which is actually the opposite, because if you make the laws very restrictive and divorced from reality, um, they, they will be ignored. And eventually, the, also the laws that are logical will be ignored. So that just uh, uh, reaches the opposite uh, uh, outcome. But this is clearly the law. Um, otherwise, it would mean that uh, enemies would have the incentive, and that's what they do for legitimacy purposes, but even under the law, to use hospitals for the military purposes and become immune. So uh, um, the law of armed conflict has a logic. It's based mainly on morality and logic, and it's aimed to spare the civilians, but it's not divorced from reality. It, 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 it has been uh, developed through the way that, that militaries acted, through the practice of militaries throughout the years. So it, it has a, a logic. And there's no logic in saying that the hospital is always immune from attack, which means that the enemies will use these hospitals and the other side will be prevented, even if they are firing missiles from a hospital, we will be prevented from, from a, a reacting. No, it's not logical and it's not the law. The law acknowledges, as I said, that it has, that does become a lawful military objective. The only thing is you need to give a specific warning. Now, this is distinction. This is not the end of the story because there's another obligation. There's first an obligation to take precautions, feasible precautions, to, to uh, minimize harm to civilians as much as possible, to constant care, to, to, to uh, mitigate harm to civilians. Uh, but, so this, again, is only what is feasible precautions. So this means to try to use a minimum, you know, smaller ammunition, more accurate if possible, to give warnings when possible, to uh, attack at night if it's a building when people are less people are around. And this is something that is done also by Israel, and they'll come in a moment to the strategic considerations. Um, uh, but again, it's 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 again, it's not. It's only what's feasible, and feasibility changes. Sometimes, let's say, if the attack, the is the surprise is is essential, so there's no obligation to give a prior warning. If by giving the prior warning, the uh, a, the object of the attack will be uh, a, will will leave the, uh, the the place, for example, if it's a person or if it's a weapon system that can be immediately moved, so you don't have to. I mean, the law acknowledges that in such situation you don't have to give a prior advance warning. So everything is is takes into account the circumstances. And the third or uh, principle or the second main principle uh, precautions is an obligation is the principle of proportionality, which is a very tough one. But what it says in essence is that when you are attacking a lawful military objective, you can attack it even if you know that civilians might be killed. And that's also a very important thing to understand. Uh, the laws of armed conflict don't obligate a state to act in a way that causes no civilian harm, no civilian casualties. Um, uh, and so even if you know that civilians might be killed, you don't have an obligation to refrain from the attack. What you have is an obligation to estimate what would be the collateral harm to civilians. You're not targeting civilians. That's unlawful. But if you are targeting a military objective and civilians might get killed, you have to make an evaluation. What would be the anticipated harm to civilians? You have to make an evaluation. What is the expected military advantage from attacking this target? And then you have to do the balancing. If the expected harm to civilians is excessive in comparison to the military advantage, then this is an un, a, 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 not an un, non, -propor non proportionate attack and an unlawful attack. So again, the military advantage gets more weight under the laws of war because only if the collateral harm to civilians is considered excessive, would it be considered a not proportionate? But can I jump in there? When we see yeah. images of Gaza right now, we are seeing um, everywhere you look, it's bomb department buildings ruined. It's, it looks like Chechnya. Was, was there a was there a Hamas? And Mosul, it looks like Mosul. It looks like Raqqa after the coalition forces fought there. Yeah. Was there a Hamas fighter in every apartment building? I mean, what's the military advantage in in attacking all of these buildings? Yeah. Okay. So here we have to understand what is the tactic of the Hamas. The, the tactic of the Hamas was, and the, the Islamic Jihad, by the way, uh, similarly, uh, is to operate from within civilian buildings that there are almost no military bases maybe one you see that everything is civilian and underneath civilian buildings they what they created is a web of tunnels that go under there's like an under city there's an underground city in the gaza strip which is a very densely populated area so these and there they operate from there they also acknowledge it it's not 
you can listen to their, they, 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 they say that that's what they're doing. There was, there was one of the Hamas leaders who was interviewed on the Russian TV and he was asked, why don't you allow the civilians to go into the tunnels when Israel is bombing so they protect to protect their lives? And he said, no, the tunnels are meant for us, for our military operations. The civilians, 75% of them are refugees. They are the responsibility of the UN. Okay, so we have, first of all, we see exactly how they care about the civilians, which is the, the answer is they don't, actually the opposite. I will explain in a minute, but but anyway, they acknowledge that they have tunnels. There's been many articles by independent uh, correspondent uh, that saw these tunnels. So now they operate and they move within these tunnels. So to get to the tunnels, the only way is to try to 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 target the tunnels. And when you target a tunnel, the buildings that are on top of the tunnel can collapse. Even if you're targeting one part of the of the tunnel, a building that is here can also collapse because everything is linked. So you also don't always know exactly what will be the outcome because you don't know exactly what, where the tunnel goes to. But there's no other way. That's also important to understand. There's no way to get to the civ to the military infrastructure of the Hamas without attacking these civilian objects and these tunnels, and that leads to this huge harm to uh, civilian objects, to civilian buildings in, 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 in Gaza, admittedly. The northern part of Gaza is, is, is really um, under a severe destruction. Um, but, but the thing is to understand that there's no alternative. It's not that Israel could choose. Once, the, once the Israel understood that, the, that Hamas is a huge, huge military threat to its security to its existence even, especially if you have this axis of evil of Iran and Hezbollah and all the others looking at what will happen. If if Israel is conceived as weak, unable to, to, to even confront the Hamas, they will come for the kill. And the Hamas in itself it has made, we have 120,000 internally displaced Israelis from the south that cannot go back to their homes. We have another additional 100,000 from the north. Um, Israel is at a state of war. This is not another round of operation. So we are facing an imminent threat from the Hamas. And the only way to eliminate it is to eliminate its military capabilities and to eliminate all or at least the vast majority of its military capabilities. And the only way to do that is to go off after this infrastructure that is scattered all around the Gaza Strip. So it's not, you can't also, it's not enough to, to attack one uh, building with some rockets and that's it or what th th that will not do anything so so this means that we have all these scattered attacks and they cause a lot of harm they're killing also many we also have beyond the destruction of the infrastructure the military infrastructure there's also many uh, hamas fighters many hamas fighters that have been killed so and this is also Part of the military advantage. The idea is to, to eliminate their military capabilities, including their military forces. There are hundreds or even thousands of casualties among the military forces of the Hamas. Now, when they count the numbers and they say 11,000 or 12,000, this is, first of all, we don't know if the figures are correct because the Hamas is the Hamas that takes out the figures. Truth is not a relevant factor there. Mm -hmm. And secondly, these numbers include the Hamas fighters that are actually not civilians. They are part of the equation on the other side of the military advantage. We also have to understand that. And, and we have to understand that when we look at the military advantage and the proportionality, the threat, the level of threat is relevant in a, a analyzing what is the military advantage. And, and if I may say, I just read an article on lawfare uh, by someone who made a, a good analysis, legal analysis, Lawfare is a legal blog yeah. of the proportionality in use and bail. And then he comes and says, look, at the US and the UK and the coalition forces, when they were fighting the uh, ISIS, they had, a, a, they made some estimates, they had to 14, 20 civilian casualties for a, in an attack. And it, clearly Israel is a, is a much is doing much, much more than that. And that means that it's acting disproportionately. And I'm saying, first of all, we don't have these kinds of charts. You have to make the decision on each uh, attack. But, but, but he completely ignores a very, very critical difference. ISIS was a, was a, was a, a, a terrible enemy, was vicious and dangerous and, 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 and uh, as, as uh, the Hamas uh, and cruel, but it wasn't 
causing a direct threat, wasn't posing, sorry, a direct threat to the US or the UK. This was a threat that there would be terror attacks in their country, but mainly the threat was to the Muslims living in uh, Syria and Iraq. Here, Israel is under a concrete and direct and imminent threat to its existence. We are not, Israel since the 7th of October stopped, stopped, our life has stopped, has ceased. Uh, we, we, we are a completely, this is a war situation. This is like our independence war. All Israelis also aligned. We were, we were marching in the streets. I was one of those against this government because we were afraid of the democratic values being eroded or morality being eroded. The, the reservists were um, protesting and saying, we're not going to come to reserve duty because we don't trust the government to give us a uh, moral orders. You know, mm -hmm. Nobody's protesting now. They're all fighting. Nobody's protesting in Israel. Nobody's against what he's doing. Everybody in Israel believes, knows that what we are doing is what we have to do because we're under this, existential threat under this concrete threat, if the US and the UK were under such threat, if there were rockets being fired at uh, London and people being held uh, hostage from uh, England and the people uh, can't, that couldn't go home and uh, and the fear and an enemy saying, I did it once, I'm going to do it again and again and again until, until UK doesn't exist, until England, let's say, doesn't exist anymore. They wouldn't uh, limit it to 40 people, I, I assure you. So yeah, no, that's, you can't that's make true. these comparisons. It's not it's no, that's, not it's really, it's really um it's really important comparison. Um other other UN um specialists have said that um that that Palestinians in Gaza are in danger of, of genocide. Um now on the face of it, it seems a bit dumb because two million there are two million. Gazans and and approximately depending on it if you believe the Hamas figures fifteen thousand Gazans have have died and that's obviously a lot of people but it doesn't seem like genocide but and yet these people have said it again they've stated their reputation on it so um, I mean can you can you explain what genocide is legally and why they would say that that Gazans are in danger of it. The level of genocide has an intention. Yes, your intention is to eliminate a certain people, a certain uh, ethnic uh, group, or other kind of group. Um, the ones that are talking in genocide terms are Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, Iran. They are talking about eliminating the state of Israel, all the Israelis, all the Jews, even. Uh, so they have a genocidal uh, intention, and, and it was also part of their intention when they carried out the attacks on the seventh of October, um, and and they and and it even it enters into the because it can also be in a limited area. Uh, Israel has never expressed an intent and has no intent to exterminate the Palestinians. It's it's never been an issue. Yes, you have some extreme people. Some of them, I admit, are in the coalition. Uh, that's thinking, talking about annihilating uh, Gaza or about uh, uh, expelling all the people of Gaza. This is not the government policy. This is not the IDF policy. Um, yes, we have our extreme right that are there, but they have been uh, pushed away from any decision uh, making uh, capable uh, uh, posts. So they 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 speak, they they say these nonsense, but they don't really have an impact on what is happening. So in, in Israel. Now, first of all, these people talking about genocide have been talking about genocide that Israel is carrying out a genocide against Palestinians even beforehand. It's uh, it's already we've heard that before. And look at the numbers. Mm. You know, there are a few charts showing about the numbers of uh, Jews before the Holocaust and after the Holocaust, Armenians before the uh, Armenian uh, um, a, 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 um, how do you call it? A, a, a extermination and ego, and and then you see the Palestinians before and after. They have their numbers have gone. Uh, I don't know ten, hundred times the more. Israel has not done that and has no intention in doing that. Um, so it's this is just terminology. It's it's an idea that has been introduced into the Western progressive liberal circles. This idea that Israel is this is this. Uh, the, the, the conflict, everything is very black and white today. Yes, they are the bad guys and the good guys. Israel is the bad guy. It's the occupied, the colonialist power that has come and they, and wants to exterminate the Palestinians. The fact that there's no, this is default completely from reality. Israel is not a colonial power. It came here, the Jews, with the links to Israel after the Holocaust, it, under a decision of the United Nations. The Arabs did, once didn't accept the partition plan. It has been trying to reach peaceful resolution with the Palestinians 
for many years, the Palestinians have been also the ones that refused because they didn't accept that the state of Israel can exist. Now we are not fighting the Palestinians, now we are fighting the Hamas. The Hamas doesn't acknowledge that Israel has a right to exist. There's no peaceful resolution of the conflict as long as the Hamas is there. Once it finishes with us, it will go against all the moderate Palestinians. The Hamas is an enemy of peace. Every time in, two, in the 90s, when we were in the Oslo process, in the two, beginning of 2000, when we thought, and I was part of the peace negotiations, when we thought that peace is around the corner, that we're going to get there, um, the Hamas started this, this uh, terror campaign to stop it. The, the, now again, every time there's any chance of peace, they are against peace. So this is a com complicated conflict. You need to make compromises. I admit this current government, which I'm not fond of, as an ideological street that I don't agree with. But most Israelis do agree and were agreeing to two-state solution for many years, and it's still the majority, the slim majority, but it's still there. But under different conditions, including security, and, and now more than ever, yes, there is a big fear to our security, to our lives. <laughs> If we have a Palestinian state that is not demilitarized, that, they, that we cannot operate there. So they are legal, and they're not legal, they are legitimate concerns here, and it's a difficult uh, conflict. But in the world, black and white, we are black, they are white, they are the victims, that they, no matter what they do, Hamas and the Palestinians are all together. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, means no Israel, that's okay, because again, we are some kind of colonialist power that can go back to where we came from, which I don't know where that is. Um, and mainly for the Jews that came from Arab states, clearly it's not an option, but also in Europe, we don't seem very uh, welcome at the moment. Um, so, so, so this is the, really some kind of framing of many years of, of twisted teaching of the history and of the conflict and people just buy it. And uh, now we are paying, we are, we are seeing the price of of this, these twisted uh, twisted ideas of, of, of what's going on here without really understanding the complexity of the conflict. Can, can I pull your attention to something? You've, 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 basic, you've, you've half answered it, but I just want a bit more clarity if, if that's all right. Um, I, I know we've probably only got a couple more minutes. In, in previous rounds of conflict, and you've described this in, 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 your, in your role when you were with the IDF, um, that Israel was always very, very careful when it chose targets as you said you know it would pick a building here pick, pick a building there make sure do yeah. everything it could to make sure that there were no civilians at the building but now Israel's been less careful um and as you say that's because the the threat to Israel posed by Hamas Israel I guess but it, I, Israel has realized that the threat posed by Hamas is more serious I guess than than they used to think it was because Hamas has actually quick carried out this attack um but Will that will that sort of be allowed? The fact that Israel is less careful now than it than it used to be. I think that uh, it's uh, sorry. I'm just <laughs> my next day. Uh, um, one second. Just answering my uh, sorry. Um, I think that uh, the definition of the aims of this operation are different of this war compared to other operations that uh, has an impact of the choice of targets and of the uh, uh, level of force used. Uh, in previous operations, um, the idea was mainly to uh, deter the Hamas, to limit its capabilities as much as possible, uh, with an understanding that eventually the Hamas will continue to control the area, but uh, that we wanted to have it, that uh, to to uh, erode its capabilities as much as possible, and um, also uh, uh, deter it from uh, because it will pay prices of doing it again, at least for a certain amount of time, knowing that we'll have another round one day. Um, but these were like limited rounds. They caused a lot of uh, problems in Israel, rockets being fired all the time, uh, in, uh, also limited the intrusion in, in cases that they did enter into Israel. We always managed to counter those. Now, the, the aim of the operation after what they did, and I didn't even talk about the horrendous uh, atrocities that they did that also made it clear that they there's a complete dehumanization of Israelis and Jews in their side. Uh, because really I've been reading and seeing the testimonies and it's it's horrific. It's really, it's worse than anything I've ever read. Um, and uh, so um, now the uh, the aim of this operation is, the, is to eliminate the Hamas 
from, to, 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 from all its military capabilities or for the vast majority in order to make sure that Hamas doesn't continue to control the Gaza Strip. Since this is the aim of the operation, this, this also impacts what, uh, and this is a legitimate aim of a military operation, uh, so this impacts on what targets you go after and uh, what level of force you use and when you do you still go ahead even if there are civilian casualties because in many cases the limitations that Israel imposed upon itself in previous operations were policy oriented the idea was that if we if we attack a hospital even though we could because it was used and we would give the warning but there would be many civilian casualties if, and let's say we warned them and let's say it even would be proportionate it would be it was clear that this would put a lot, not only into external pressure, it would uh, maybe make the violence last longer, uh, it could create more uh, friction, more tension. So again, if you're not aiming at, at, at dismantling the Hamas completely, so you say, okay, I, won't, I will pay so many prices, for policy reasons, I will not, I will not uh, uh, do this. But now, since the aim is different and it's much wider, um, so it means that, uh, that these kinds of policy considerations are not there. We have other policy considerations. The international legitimacy is still, still very important for us, but, but we cannot afford, and that's another thing, we want to have the international legitimacy. It's very important for Israel, but when, when you have a choice, you can say, okay, for international legitimacy, I won't do something. But when you don't have a choice, when your your faith your back is against the wall and your enemy is pointing a gun at your head, um, then the international legitimacy is a little bit less relevant. Okay, so we we know that we will pay a price, uh, but uh, but the other price, the alternative price, is uh, is is something that we cannot afford because we're not you know, and the law doesn't obligate a state to commit suicide. There's no such uh, legal obligation, and this is what we feel that the international community or part of it is expecting us to do. Mm. Um, and just to end, end because I, I have to go by the Hamas, and I think it's very important to understand the strategy of the Hamas, because I mentioned it before, but I want to put it, and I think it's a, the Hamas is, has this win-win strategy, okay? By using the civilians as shields, and it's using them actively as shields. It's not enabling civilians that want to leave. It's not enabling them to leave. It's firing, and we have enough for evidence and proof of that, it's firing at civilians that are that are trying to live uh, in the, these corridors that we are uh, provided for them. The Hamas is doing everything it, it does it can to keep as many civilians there, so that as many civilians, uh, Palestinian civilians, get killed. And this is a win-win strategy because then Israel has two choices: either because of the fear that civilians might be killed, not to carry out the attack, which means that the Hamas retains its military capability. Win. Or Israel does carry out the attack because that's the only way to get rid of this military capability. There are many civilian casualties. And again, the numbers are always also exaggerated and everybody's civilian, as I said before, and everybody's children. Those that I have children, children, children include 16 and 17 year olds that are fighting for the Hamas. And many, many of these age are fighting for the Hamas, so they're not civilians. But anyway, but, but admittedly there are many casualties. Then they push this to the international community, international organizations, and Israel is put under this pressure, not the Hamas, Israel is put under pressure to stop its operations. And then it means that it might need to stop its operation, won't go after the other military capabilities. And again, the Hamas retains its military capabilities, win again. So it's a win-win. And by the international community letting them letting them use the strategy and get away with it, it means that it's a good strategy. So they will use civilians again and again and again. So if the, if the idea is to spare the lives of civilians, to protect civilians, it should be the opposite. It should, they should not it, they have the ability to, to use this tactic, and then they will not have the incentive to use the civilians as shields next time. But the world doesn't understand this logic, unfortunately, it's at our expense, unfortunately. And again, Israel, everybody in Israel, including the left, including the liberals, including those that oppose this government and were fighting against this government, everybody here is united in the understanding that we have to beat the Hamas. And, uh, and I think this also should be uh, uh, something relevant when examining whether we are acting morally, because it is very important for us to act morally and legally, and still we think that we have no choice but to do what we are doing. Thank you. 
Um, so, then, sorry, uh, I have to go to another. Uh, I love it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry for stuffing up the time. Um, okay. Have a have a great day. I'll see you. I'll bring in, I'll bring in Phil Deladakis. Bye, Bye, Nina. Um, so that, that was, um, that was, I'm great. I'm very grateful for Nina that she gave us half an hour. Um, that was my fault. I stuffed up the time. She was expecting to join at 1 p.m. Israel time, not 11 o'clock Israel time. And she actually had a meeting, a, a, another meeting scheduled just then that she that she pushed off a half an hour for us. So the reason that Phil was here, Phil, um, for those of you who don't, who don't know, um, is a former um, minister for small business innovation and something trade um, in the Victorian government. Um, Phil has long been an excellent communicator. And now that we've had a very rushed crash course in some of the um, the aspects and principles of laws of armed conflict, it's all very well and good to go heavily into the weeds as Panina just did. But it's really hard, I find, to talk about these issues um, with with our colleagues or our friends who don't um, who who don't understand who are asking the difficult questions. And that's why I brought Phil along. He's a very um, good communicator. So Phil, why don't I? start with the first question that I asked um, Panina, and I'll ask you the same thing, and that is, if Israel isn't targeting civilians, why are so many people dying? If a journalist asked you that or a colleague asked you that question, how would you answer that question? Yeah, so it, it's a great question. It's a question that's asked uh, a lot to me uh, by people that I know that aren't Jewish. And uh, I'm going to come to it, but there are a couple of things that I want to say off the bat straight away, uh, if I may. The first one is people shouldn't be afraid of saying exactly what uh, Panini said was about, about the Netanyahu government. When I was in parliament, uh, I spoke against uh, Netanyahu more than just about anybody, uh, predominantly because being Jewish, I was probably afforded that uh, that right more than anybody else. But also to uh, to decry, for example, the expansion of settlements in the West Bank. So when you're having these discussions with people, please don't feel afraid or confronted to be able to say what you think. If you don't feel that way, of course, you don't need to manufacture it. The number one key point when you're having discussions with uh, friends or family or, or professional work colleagues is for, uh, for your comments uh, to be from the heart and not to sound scripted. That's the first thing. Now, to come back to your question, why are civilians dying? Well, it's it's a tragedy, and uh, some people uh, think that that uh, that when I say that I weep for every Palestinian innocent civilian that dies as if they were Jewish, they think that I'm just saying that, uh, but I'm not. I I genuinely do, and and for me. That's important for, for, for both myself and the Jewish community to maintain our humanity within, obviously, the depths of the depravity that we're, we're seeing and that we're faced with, uh, both in Israel and, and obviously Gaza. Let's not forget, and, 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 and this is important for everybody when you're having these discussions, people talk about ceasefires, and I'm sure, Bren, that'll be a question of yours shortly. There was a ceasefire on October 6th. That ceasefire was broken on October 7th by Hamas. Hamas, whether people like to admit this or not, are the governing government of Gaza. In 2005, when Ariel Sharon unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, uh, he did so with the Palestinian Authority in charge after he left. There were elections at the end of 2006 and 2007 where... Fatah was defeated and Hamas won control of the government. Since then, in 16 years subsequent, there has not been any free, fair, open elections at all. In fact, uh, evidence shows that after they came to power, one of the first things that Hamas did was that they rounded up all of the Fatah officials and either killed them or put them in jail. Now, if, if we... Fatah officials, they went to all the clan uh, leaders and murdered them as well. Correct, but predominantly Fatah because they were the major political mm -hmm. opponents. Now, if we fast forward to the events of 2000, uh, uh, 2023 on October 7th, Hamas breached the 
uh, the security fence uh, and undertook what is considered an act of war. They invaded another country, being Israel, with between 2,500, which is the figure I use, but up to 3,000 fighters of their most senior military brigades. As I say to people, this was not a half a dozen blokes that went on an outback trip and then turned left instead of going right and decided to kill a couple of people on the way through. They were some of the most uh, trained and advanced uh, uh, soldiers within their military brigades. So that's the, the, the first thing. There was a ceasefire. They broke it. They broke it by attacking innocent civilians, not military combatants. They attacked, brutally raped, murdered, and mutilated civilians. And then what they did was that they then kidnapped some 240-odd uh, individuals, again, women, children, elderly, disabled people, and took them back into Gaza where they've held them since. Now, under any circumstances, under any declaration of war, Israel has the right to defend itself. Now, we can go into the Geneva Convention all you like. Personally, I don't always like talking about the Geneva Convention, not because it's principled and it's right, but because it sounds you're trying to be too legalistic. And you can be legalistic to support what you want to say, but it's more important to be able to point out what has happened, why it has happened, and what was the result. And then the next thing that I always say is that the Palestinians in Gaza, the innocent civilians of Gaza, are as much a victim of Hamas as the Israelis were on October 7th. And as you and I, Bren, know, and the people listening here will know as well, it was not just Israelis that were targeted. We had uh, Arab Israelis. We had Bedouins. We had Thai foreign nationals, some of which are still uh, are still uh, kidnapped at the moment. We had people from all number of nationalities murdered, including French, American, German, as we've seen, many more. We had one Australian confirmed death, as, as tragic as it is to talk about. And so... Again, then the next question is, if that happened here, what would you expect the Australian reaction to be? Now, I thank you. I agree with that. But my next question is, and for those, for the, I might add, um, I think I think people that have joined these ZFA conversations before would um, would know my Zionist credentials. So I hope everyone understands that I'm being the devil's advocate today. <laughs> um, but that, look, the Hamas killed 1,200 people on that day and that's that's horrendous and what they did is horrendous since then if i can play the devil's advocate israel has killed fifteen thousand palestinians um i mean you know if people say to you surely israel's using disproportionate force or or even if you were willing to steer away from laws of armed conflict um how can that be justified that israel kills 15 times the number of palestinians as palestinians killed israelis Okay, so certainly the first thing I always do is I always challenge the figure that people are using for a number of reasons, right? And it's not to sound callous and cold. It's to say that the figures that are being used are being thrown around by Hamas officials and they have as much credibility uh, as uh, as uh, inmates in a psychiatric ward telling people that they're uh, being mistreated by, by their doctors. Now, if you have a look at the figures themselves, again, any innocent civilian death is tragic. But in those numbers, Hamas are also including fighters that have died. And the last estimate I've seen is somewhere around three to three and a half thousand uh, Hamas soldiers that have died are uh, being included in that count. I think the count is probably closer to about ten and a half thousand to eleven thousand, including that three and a half thousand figure. By the way, the 8,000 innocent civilians that have potentially died uh, in the conflict is a tragedy. Uh, and again, we don't need to shy away from that. These deaths are on Hamas, number one, uh, because it was Hamas that started this conflict. And people, again, if I come back to that, but, but won't a ceasefire fix this? 
Well, again, how can we trust Hamas to stick by a ceasefire when they broke it in the first place? Now, to come back to your question, so people don't say that you're doing what politicians do and don't answer the question, right? Let's, I argue, I would then argue it with a different point. Everyone claims that the Israeli Defense Force is one of the uh, one of the most sophisticated defense forces in the world, with some of the best intelligence uh, and uh, obviously some of the best strategy strat- strategies or strategic minds uh, running their uh, running their operations. If we argue that Israel has uh, has used approximately 12,000 rockets uh, in the last month's worth of uh, military operations. People will say bombs don't get stuck up, whether it's a bomb or it's a rocket or a guided missile. But if we say 12,000 and we argue that there are 11,000 deaths, then either Israel is being extraordinarily pinpoint and precise with their operations, or they are the most inefficient uh, worst armies in the history of military conflict, because if they're only killing one person per bomb, then clearly they're either, as I said, trying to be targeted and reduce civilian deaths wherever possible, or they're useless at their jobs and they should give up their day job. It can't be both. It's either one. And and when you start to break it down like that, people start to understand. The, the other thing also, which... I, I should have said from the very get-go, I have a lot of non-Jewish friends that talk to me about this and they feel conflicted. Philip, what should we do? We we are uh, we are ashamed at the level of anti-Semitism going on. Uh, we believe strongly that Israel has the right to defend itself from the barbaric attacks that occurred, but we feel desperately sad for the innocent civilians and the women and children in particular dying in Mm -hmm. Gaza. And my response to them is my response to you is, is it's okay to feel both sides of that exact same argument. You can weep and feel sadness for every innocent death. And you can also feel sadness and weep for every Israeli death and kidnapped victim that has yet to be returned safely. These are not either or propositions. We can do both. In fact, I would say to you that not only does our humanity require us to consider both, but Judaism, which puts life ahead of everything else, requires us to do both. Fair point. Let's talk about the ceasefire, speaking of conflicting things, because, um, well, two things, really. I mean... There, there's, there's the um, the indefinite ceasefire um, that will just go on forever and 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 end this end this war, um, which some people are calling for. And then and then there's the idea of humanitarian pauses for five days or or ten days or so on. Um, on the face of it, arguing for a ceasefire is well, arguing against a ceasefire, even if there are tactical advantages for keeping the status of war and not having a ceasefire, arguing against a ceasefire can sound pretty callous. Um, how would you, I mean, I'm, I, I'm presuming that you don't think that Israel should go to an immediate ceasefire, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if that is your case, how do you say to people, look, I don't think there should be a ceasefire? Well, I mean, there can be a ceasefire. But it requires Hamas to release every single hostage, every single hostage, without fail. First thing. The second thing is they need to surrender. Right now, this is an armed conflict. This is a war. The reason that people always say that war should be the last resort is so precisely you avoid the situation that we are all in now. You avoid innocent civilians being caught up. Now, again, I I said to you, I don't want to get too technical because I think when you rely on legalistic arguments, I think then you you seem to be stretching or or clutching at straws. But let's not also forget the fact, and this is important in your discussions with your your non-Jewish friends and colleagues, that when Hamas uses civilians to hide behind, it makes them culpable under the Geneva Convention for war crimes. 
So we don't need to go into specifics, but the fact remains, if you use a hospital, if you use a kindergarten, if you use a mosque, if you use a community centre, if you're hiding in a school, you're doing so deliberately to try and avoid being a target as a military combatant. Now, obviously, with the IDF having gone into Gaza with ground forces, this will, over time, result in Israeli Defence Force deaths. And I can tell you that my family has already been touched by this. My uncle's niece uh, had her fiancé in one of the units in Gaza who died. So instead of them planning their wedding, they're now planning for a funeral. It is a tragedy, it is sad, and it is horrid. And just as every family and community will mourn the loss of every soldier that dies, we mourn the loss of every innocent victim as well. And so, again, coming back to the question at hand, the fact remains that Israel is defending itself. And people will argue whether it's proportionate or not. You can feel confident to say this will be a decision for other people to take. But when you are... Uh, an IDF uh, 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 general or making a decision around the operation, do we go green? Do we go yes? Do we go no? Do we stop? You need to determine whether there are a, a legitimate military operation for uh, the bombing that you're about to take or the, the, the guided missile that you're firing or even the ground crew that you're setting onto a building. And you need to try and uh, estimate what the level of casualties may, casualties may be. And then you need to make a decision and weigh it up. Is the potential for human casualties or innocent civilians being caught up in the military strike? Is it too great to justify the strike? Now, none of us, unless we have that information in front of us, determining who the military strike is, how senior they are, what level of involvement they've had, and if they live, what uh, what significant uh, challenges they will continue to pose to a cessation of, uh, of uh, fighting will occur. Unless you've got that knowledge in front of you, all the experts in the world can claim this and they can claim that, but they can't say it as absolute 100% fact. And so, again, when you're talking to people, you need to put say, be in this situation. What would you do? There's no right or wrong answer, by the way. It, we are we are only making decisions based upon both the information that we've got before us and also by the way that we've been brought up. And again, we all know this. The IDF operates in a far more morally and ethically uh, manner than any other defence force in the history of military operations. But it doesn't matter how much we say that. If somebody doesn't want to believe it, they're not going to believe it. You've kind of answered the next question I was going to ask, but it's, it's probably worth asking anyway um, because it's because it can be daunting. The UN, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all of these organisations that have, in the eyes of the general public, have credibility. They've all accused Israel of war crimes obviously both in this conflict and, and generally, um, you know, and then we sort of stand up and say, well, they're all lying. I mean, <laughs> what do you, like, how do you explain the fact that all of these specialists and all of these human rights experts and human rights organizations all seem to say that it's Israel that is, that is committing war crimes? So it's a great question. I'm glad you still asked it because I don't think I've actually answered this one uh, previously. I'll give you two examples. The first one is it was a number of weeks ago uh, when some humanitarian aid started to go through uh, the Rafa crossing. And one of the uh, UN, uh, I can't believe this actually happened, to be honest with you, uh, because it's connected to the UN. Uh, but one of the UN relief agencies put out on X or Twitter on social media that Hamas had visited their compound and stolen uh, food, had stolen, uh, I think it was medical supplies as well, 
uh, and uh, and just taken them when they were meant to be for civilians. Three hours later, three hours later, those posts were removed, deleted. Now, the UN won't tell you why, but I will tell you that those people will have had their lives threatened on the ground and said that if they don't delete it, then they would have either been expelled from Gaza or something worse would have happened to them and their physical uh, well-being. This is what happens to any of the relief agencies on the ground. Now, I said I'd give you two examples. I will now give you a second one. I have absolute proof and evidence that uh, one of the Australian relief agencies that are there refused to call Hamas out because they said in correspondence that I've seen, so this is first-hand account, correspondence that I've seen, they said they cannot put the lives of their staff at risk. So we need to make sure the saying that the fog of war is held to account to all of the relief agencies and all of the humanitarian providers and all of the other agencies because they actually have people on the ground. And that's not to dismiss what they say and do. I'm not apologising or providing them a way out. People just need to be aware that the reason that they do it is because they're trying to protect their personnel. It doesn't make it right. It adds insult to injury to those people that died on October 7th. It adds insult to injury to those people that remain kidnapped. And it adds insult to injury to those innocent Palestinians that would desperately love to be free of Hamas as well. Thanks, Bill. We've only got uh, five minutes left. I want to ask a question about the large crowds that we are seeing in Australia and around the world. In Australia, it's every Sunday. Large crowds filling Melbourne and filling Sydney with uh, solidarity with the Palestinians. Um, it it really it's quite daunting for someone who is a Zionist and who um, and who sees the the that Israel is morally and legally correct in this war and that Hamas is is really the embodiment of evil. Um, and yet, I wonder if for many Australians who see that mass of people, they can't help but but come to the conclusion that 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 Israel is the oppressor here or the aggressor and Palestinians are the victims. So what do you say when, when people raise that? So when we look at the crowds, we live in a country of 25 million people. So even if there's a crowd of 30,000 people, even if there's a crowd of 40,000 people, right, it's a minority of people compared to the Australian population. So even though it feels like a significant event to some of us, even though when we see it, we become nervous and anxious and apprehensive about our own well-being, our children's well-being, our family's well-being, the well-being of people going about their daily business wearing a yarmulke or being identified as Jewish, Jewish businesses that are now being graffitied and, uh, and uh, attacked. But... What I want to give a sense to all of you here is I still fervently and strongly believe it is a minority of the population, a noisy minority, but a minority nonetheless. Now, I also would uh, suggest that there would be lucky to be 15 or 20% of the crowds that are Arab Muslim or of Palestinian background in support. And that's, of course, not to be disingenuous about the size of the crowd, but to suggest that the rest of the crowd is made up of a number of far left groups. Socialist alternative, for those of you that don't know, you can Google them later on, are not a very nice group of people. They have uh, strongly and loudly proclaimed their involvement in these protests, including, by the way, the one that was held in South Caulfield uh, Friday week back, uh, and uh, also other... Trotsky's other leftists, anarchists, have also been claiming, if you Google, that they've been involved as well. So again, uh, people are jumping on the calls for a whole range of their own reasons and not necessarily for reasons of support 
of the Palestinian people. Because, of course, if you support the Palestinian cause, then you must support the removal of Hamas. You, you, you can't support the human rights of Palestinians in Gaza unless you support the removal of Hamas. Now, I just want to just spend a, a moment on this, Brent, because I think this is important. I've seen some of the comments, and, and I'm not sure whether we're going to get to the, the questions, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer some of them if you, if you want to pick some out. But uh, if you have a look at the level of, uh, of uh, action in other neighbouring countries, or even if we look at the West Bank, I can tell you from information that I know of that the Iranians through uh, some of their Hamas uh, uh, local uh, units in the West Bank have attempted to incite significant rallies uh, against what's happening in Gaza and against Israel. And if you remember back to 2014, there was a very strong uprising or an intifada out of the West Bank when there was conflict in Gaza. And it was organic and it was led by many people in the community in the West Bank. We have not seen that uprising now. And the reason we've not seen it is because there are a lot of Palestinians in the West Bank that look at what's happening in Gaza and say, we don't want to be uh, involved with that because of the way that it came about. It is not an organic uprising. The same thing in Jordan. Jordan, of course, for most people will know that 85% of the Jordanian population are Palestinian. Again, you see some uprising, you see protests, but not at the same level. Lebanon, Egypt, nearly any major uh, neighbour of Israel in the Middle East, you are not seeing the same level of uprising that we saw in 2014. And the reason for that is because they understand what happened on October 7th was as a direct result of Hamas undertaking uh, an act of war and Israel is responding this time. Yeah, bang on. Thank you, Phil. Look, we are going to stop it there because it's nine o'clock. Before we go, let me say a couple of things. First of all, I'm just adding to the chat, the ZFA has a frequently asked questions page. The link there is, is in the chat. Um, uh, a lot of uh, Some of those questions are to do with um, the laws of armed conflict and there are other issues there. Have a look at those. Um, have a look at those questions. If there are, hopefully, they will answer some of your questions. I'm going to have a look at the written questions in the Q and A box that we'll put here. If I can't, if I can answer them, I will get back to you and answer them. If I can't, I will put those questions to either Phil or Panina, depending on who it's relevant to, and we will get the answers to you. Um, and if there are good questions there that aren't on the frequently asked questions page on the ZFA website. I will put those questions on the page and answer them there. The second thing and the final thing I want to say is there is currently circulating around Australia a letter of solidarity. This letter will be handed by the ZFA president, Jeremy Liebler, to the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, in about a week, week and a half's time. That letter of solidarity basically says that the Australian Jewish community, plus its allies and friends, stand with Israel at this time. We want as many people as possible to sign that letter. So when we hand it to the president of Israel and through him to the people of Israel, they will know that there are thousands of Australians that stand in solidarity with Israel. Currently 4,500 people have signed that. I think we can get many more names. If you haven't seen this letter, please go to zfa.com.au forward slash solidarity. Read the letter. If you like it, sign it and share it. And if you have signed it already, share it. And if you've shared it already, share it again. If everyone on this call, there's still 172 people here. If everyone on this call can share it with people and get five people to sign that letter, that would be a magnificent outcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. It was a little bit mixed up in the beginning, but we got um, our two speakers uh, for half the time each, which is brilliant. Phil, thank you very much for coming, for your time, for your answers. Um, and, uh, and may we all have um, more more peaceful times in the in the coming weeks and months. Good night, everyone. I'm Israel. Hi. I'm Israel. Hi. Good night.